I told you that we are going to, over the next several weeks, and I said eight weeks, we are going to be discussing our convictions. What are those things that we as Christians believe? What do we believe as Christians? And I am going to invite you to take notes on, on, these, uh, on this series because it's, uh, I'm, I'm not just preaching it for your edification and, and for you to be uh, excited about it. I could do that, but I'm really teaching this. It's more of a teaching series. Someone once told me, why do you do a teaching on a Sunday? Why, why not do it on a Wednesday or a Thursday? And I'm just going to be really honest. I'm going to tell you what I told them. I said, well, it's hard enough sometimes to get people here on a Sunday. So uh, we want to make sure that we get this teaching to as many people as possible. Sundays, we feel like it's sometimes the best day. But this is good stuff regardless. I mean, whether it's a Sunday, whether it's a Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever day it is, this is good stuff. So I want to invite you to take notes. Feel free to take notes now, uh, but, but come ready to take notes uh, for future sermons. Let me tell you this. I thought that I could cover this question in one sermon. How many of you know that I was very naive to think that I could cover who is God in just one sermon? I don't think I could cover it in really... Uh, Several sermons. I could probably preach for the rest of my life trying to uncover and unpack that question and never be able to do it. I thought I could do it in one sermon. I cannot do it in one sermon unless you guys want to stay late. Anybody? No. <laughs> no, I can't do it in one message. I have to at least break it down to two. And uh, so our series is going to extend. We're going to have a little mini series inside of a series. And that's sometimes what happens when you're talking about who is God. Who is God? That's a great question. Over the next two weeks, we're going to be hopefully unpacking that for you. But today, we want to start with just a very basic question. It's the existence of God. The question is, does God exist? Now, if you're here, you probably believe that he does. If you're watching online, you might believe that he does. But, but most of us, we would say, yeah, God exists. He exists. However, there are those people called atheists that we've heard of that do not believe that God exists. And they have their reasons for not believing what we believe concerning God's existence. Today, what I hope to do is I hope to share with you some arguments as to why we believe as Christians that God exists. And by arguments, I don't mean that we're going to shout at you or that we're going to fight in any way, but rather show you, give you a reason as to why we even believe this is true. Now, back in 2006, a journalist by the name of Gary Wolf, he coined a term called the new atheism. And the new atheism was basically a brand of atheists that didn't just want to claim they were atheists, but rather they wanted to fight against theism. They wanted to come against atheism. And these are uh, what some might call the four horsemen of atheism. Uh, Richard Dawkins, if you've never heard that name, I, I invite you to check him out, who he is. Uh, one of his books that he wrote, and he, to me, is kind of like the main leader, although he's losing some influence. But Richard Dawkins, to me, seems to be the, the one that really is leading the charge here. He wrote a book, a famous book, by the way, called The God Delusion. Uh, then you have Sam Harris. He's another atheist that will debate and fight against theism, uh, Christianity, and, and all the other theisms out there. But uh, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, he has passed away at this point, but he's another one. And Daniel Dennett, these are all atheists that won't just say, I don't believe in God, but their goal is actually to destroy, believe me, destroy the influence that Christians have upon society and truly any theist has upon society. Uh, Richard Dawkins, he's so unapologetic that this is a quote. This is a very real quote. You can watch this. It's on video where you can see him saying these very words, talking about Christians in particular. He's saying, mock them, ridicule them in public. 
Don't fall for the convention that we're all too polite to talk about religion. This is the kind of speech rhetoric that uh, Richard Dawkins will share with people. They don't just believe that, that there is no God. They believe that the influence of people who believe in God is a virus to society. In fact, in his documentary, The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins says just that. He says that clergy that uh, spread the gospel or that talk about God, uh, that we're spreading the virus. I am right now spreading the virus, not the coronavirus, but the religious virus. He, in his mind, I am spreading the virus, and for that reason, I must be stopped. Not only does he believe that about me, he believes that about you. He believes that if you share any kind of religious faith with anyone, your faith with anyone, he believes that you are spreading a virus there as well. And he also believes that teachers that teach this spread the virus. He even believes that parents that share with their children uh, the truths of the Bible, the truths about God, God, he believes that they are also spreading the virus. You and I are virus spreaders in Mr. Dawkins' opinion. Now, uh, I want to show you kind of the counter to who they are. These are just some Christian apologists. I just thought it'd be good to show you not just the, you know, not just the atheist, but who is out there defending the faith. Well, these are four popular ones. Uh, there are more than this, but there's William Lane Craig, there's Frank Turek, there's J. Warner Wallace, there's Greg Kokel, and uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about their books a little later that I think you should uh, purchase and read. Uh, I think that, that they they are just uh, really a, a breath of fresh air of people that believe in God and have no problem arguing for God. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed, but man, these guys look happy. I mean, they have smiles on their faces. They're, they're smiling on their faces. In fact, I, I thought about it. I really did. I really did try to find their best pictures that I could find online for both camps. And uh, when I look at the new atheists, these guys just, I mean, look at Richard Dawkins. These guys are not happy people. And, and even if I found a picture where he's smirking, he's kind of smirking. Not even, I can't even get a full smile out of him. And, and you know what, to be honest with you, and I am not saying this in any condescending way, but just as a matter of reality and a matter of truth, with atheism, they will admit to you, these new atheists will admit to you that with atheism, there is no hope. That you simply live and die and there is no afterlife. There is nothing to look forward to. So live for today is what they would say. And, and they're right. In, in the atheist atheistic worldview, there is no hope. So it kind of makes sense that, that you wouldn't have much to smile about. When I look at them, I look at the Christians uh, that, that do defend our faith, I say, man, there is a difference. There is certainly a difference. I want to give you four classical arguments for our faith today. I want to give you four classical arguments, arguments that have been shared time and time again. Now, I want you to know I typically don't have a lot of videos in my sermons. Today, I have three. So just, just bear with me. We're going to show you three really good videos that I think are going to be very helpful. The first argument I want to talk to you about is the ontological argument. The ontological argument. Ontology has to do with being, with the study of being, what it, it means to exist. And now, when I share these arguments with you, let me tell you this. The truth is that anytime you're trying to prove something, you're trying to give evidence, typically one piece of evidence is not enough to close the case. One piece of evidence is typically not enough. For example, if I told you that person A killed person B and you said, okay, show me the evidence, the first thing I might say to you, well, evidence number one, it's that person A was with person B at the time of the murder. And you would say, well, okay, that's evidence and I can accept that. It's good evidence, but does that close the deal? No, because maybe person A was with person B, but just didn't necessarily kill that person at that time. 
So one piece of evidence by itself is not enough. Now, if I told you person A also had a motive to kill person B, well, that piece of evidence by itself is not enough evidence either. If I told you, well, person A had a weapon with which they could have killed person B, you would say, okay, that's good evidence, but again, that doesn't close the deal. I would have to give you an accumulation of evidence. When you put those three pieces of evidence together, now you start thinking, and now you start saying, yeah, there's a very, very good possibility that this is the case. When I share my arguments for God today, I want you to know that not a single one all by itself, is really going to show us that there is a God. However, when you put them together, when you say, well, this plus this plus this plus this certainly points to an intelligent being. And today, by the way, although I am a Christian, you're a Christian, right now we're not going to talk necessarily so much about the Christian God. Uh, My goal is to show you that there is a God. Whether that God is Yahweh, the God that we serve, whether that God is Allah, whether that God is whatever God it is, my hope is just to to prove to you that we at least have enough evidence to believe that there is a God. Again, first argument is ontological argument, and I'll admit to you, this argument is two things. Number one, I think it's a little difficult to wrap your head around And number two, I don't think it's the best argument, but it definitely gives us a starting point. When I share this argument with you, if you've never heard this argument before, at first glance, it's going to seem very circular. It's going to seem as if this argument doesn't make much sense. But I guarantee you that if you were to study this argument deeper and meditate on it and think about it a little further, it would make much more sense. It's not the best argument, I'll admit that. And uh, at the same time, it's not the easiest to wrap your head around. So I'll share the argument with you. Again, it's a philosophical argument. This is the argument. God is a being than which no greater can be conceived. Uh, I'll just stop right there. God, in in, in, in his essence, he is the greatest being. He's the, not just the greatest, he's the maximally greatest being. We can conceive that there is a God, that that there is a being that is greater than every other being. That is where it starts. We can conceive it. It makes sense in our minds. It makes sense in our minds that there could be a being that is greater than all other beings. Now, existence is greater than non-existence. So in order for this to be really the greatest being, this being needs to exist rather than not exist. Because if this being only exists in our minds, then this being is not actually the greatest being because he doesn't exist. Therefore, God must exist. Okay, I'll let that sink in a little bit. <laughs> Let's, okay, therefore, the first time I heard this argument, I was in seminary, and I scratched my head so much that my head hair started falling out in the back. All right, that's how it all started. Ever since then, it's just been every time I get ready to preach, I'm like, holy cow. But, but that's how that started. Um, this is a, listen to it again, I'll share it one more time. God is a being which no greater can be conceived. You can't, we can conceive that there is a greatest being. Existence is greater than non-existence. Therefore, God exists. Now, this is why I needed a video here. This is a video by Dr. William Lane Craig. Uh, He is one of the greatest apologists I've ever seen. The man is far more brilliant than I am. Uh, his academics will prove it for sure. And once you see this video, you'll see, oh yeah, that's totally smarter than Pastor Rob. Uh, But I want to share this video with you, and I've asked our team uh, to share it. This is uh, a video of the ontological argument.
In the year 1078, a monk named Anselm of Canterbury astonished the world by arguing that if it is even possible that God exists, then it follows logically that God does exist. Anselm's argument came to be called the ontological argument and it has sharply divided philosophers ever since. The 19th century German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer called it a charming joke but many prominent 20th century philosophers such as Charles Hartshorn, Norman Malcolm and Alvin Plantinga think that it's sound. Here it is. God can be defined as a maximally great being. If something were greater than God, then that being would be God. And in order to be maximally great, a maximally great being would have to be all-powerful, all-knowing and morally perfect in every possible world. Possible worlds are simply ways the world could have been. To say that something exists in a possible world is just to say that if the world were that way, then the thing would have existed. For example, even though unicorns don't exist in the actual world, it seems at least possible that they could have. So we can say that unicorns exist in some possible world. On the other hand, a married bachelor does not exist in any possible world because the idea of a married bachelor is logically incoherent. It could not possibly exist. So if it is possible that a maximally great being exists, then we can say that he exists in some possible world. But wait, a maximally great being would not really be maximally great if it existed in only some possible worlds. To be maximally great, it has to be all-powerful, all-knowing and morally perfect in every possible world. So think about it. If a maximally great being exists in any possible world, then it exists in every possible world. And if it exists in every possible world, then it exists in the actual world. That is, a maximally great being actually exists. Thus, the atheist has to maintain not simply that God does not exist, but that it is impossible that God exists. Here's a summary of the ontological argument. Steps 2 through 6 are straightforward and largely uncontroversial. But what about point number 1? Clearly, if it can be shown that the idea of a God is logically incoherent, then the argument fails. But is the idea of a maximally great being absurd? Like a married bachelor or a square circle or the smell of blue? This doesn't seem to be the case. The notion of an all-powerful, all-knowing, morally perfect being that exists in every possible world seems to be a perfectly coherent idea. But couldn't we parody this argument and make it work for anything? Why not say, it's logically possible that a maximally great pizza exists. Therefore, a maximally great pizza does exist. However, the idea of a maximally great pizza is not like the idea of a maximally great being. In the first place, there aren't intrinsic maximal values that make pizzas great. There could always be one more pepperoni to increase its greatness. It's not even obvious what properties make a pizza great. Thin crust or thick crust, extra cheese, anchovies? It's relative to the taste of the consumer. In the second place, a maximally great pizza would have to exist in every logical possible world. But that would mean that it couldn't be eaten. So it wouldn't really be a pizza, because a pizza is something you can eat. The idea of a maximally great pizza turns out not to be a coherent idea. The idea of God, on the other hand, is an intuitively coherent idea. Therefore, his existence is a possibility. And the ontological argument shows that if God possibly exists, then God actually exists. Okay. So I hope that helped a little bit more to understand that argument. Again, you don't have to agree with the argument, but at least uh, just the reality that the argument follows, that it, it's logically possible. The second argument I have for you is in the cosmological argument. 
not the cosmetic argument, but rather the cosmological argument, having to do with the cosmos. And the real question here is, how did everything begin? How did this world start? How did it all come together? Well, scientists used to believe in what's called the steady state, which basically means that there was an infinite world, that that the universe itself was infinite. It never had a beginning. And because the universe is infinite, now we are here. However, there is a uh, man by the name of uh, Edwin Hubble. You may know about the uh, Hubble telescope. He discovered back in 1929 that there was, that, that the universe itself was expanding. That the universe was expanding. He, he looked through the telescope and saw that the, that the universe was expanding. It was his discovery This was back in 1929. And because the universe is expanding, then it makes sense that the universe didn't just expand out of nothing, but rather it came back from a single point. It must have started at a single point. Now, Albert Einstein did not agree with him initially until he himself took a look look through the Hubble telescope and said for himself, he said, I am sorry, I was wrong. There was a single point. Now that gave credence to the Big Bang Theory, right? So the Big Bang Theory, that everything started from a Big Bang, but it also gave credence, or at least more credence rather, to uh, what we believe, have always believed as Christians, when the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. As Christians, we've always maintained that the universe is not, hear me again, the universe is not uh, infinite, but rather the God that created the universe is infinite. Did you know one of the One of my favorite verses in scripture is the scripture that says, for in God we live, we move, and we have our beings, that we exist all inside of God. The universe itself exists inside of God. God is that maximally great being, just like we heard just a moment ago. But the cosmological argument argues that we get to see the world, which is the effect, but every effect has, we know this to be true, every effect has a what? A cause. Every effect. If the universe is the effect, then what was the cause? As believers, we say God is the cause. He's the one that caused the universe into existence. And, And the truth is that we know this intuitively. Like, for example, if you woke up this morning and there was a Tesla in your garage, you would not just assume that it appeared. You would automatically assume, wait, somebody brought the Tesla in, opened my garage, and parked it there. Things don't just pop out of nowhere. Like, that's just our experience. If that were the case, it'd be a really scary world. If things just popped out of nowhere, that's just not the way it works. To every effect, there's a cause. And if we, the creation, are here, we believe that it's because there was a cause. And we say God was that initial cause. All right. Third argument I'd like to give you is the teleological argument. I love saying that word, teleological argument. It comes from the word telos, which basically means purpose. Teleological argument basically says there is a fine tuning to this world. Everything seems like there's a design. Like if you just look at things, there's a design to this world. There's a design to the way that that we function and we interact. Uh, it, it, It says if there's a design, then there must be a designer. Let me show you something that I absolutely love. MacBook Pros, yes. I love a MacBook Pro. 
Um, my job is sending me a new one this week, uh, and I can't wait. I'm going to be like, like a little kid waiting for every single delivery. The MacBook Pro. You look at a computer like that, it's beautiful. And the reality is you look at that and you don't say that just happened. You look at that and you say there must have been a design. But I, I want to take you a little deeper because my love for this machine here is not just what you see here. Uh, I love something that's even greater than this because I'm a nerd like that. This is the part of the computer I really love. That is the inside of a MacBook Pro. I don't even want to say what nerds call it, but, but some of you might know. That is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. To you, it may seem like nothing, but, but you got to be honest and say, wait a minute, Everything looks so perfectly in place there, and everything looks like it has a function. I see the chips, I see the fan, I see the battery, I see everything functioning together, all the connections. And, and Apple, by the way, as opposed to opening other machines, man, can you even see a wire in there? There are wires in there, but they're all carefully hidden. When you see something like this, you say to yourself, Someone must have designed this. Even if you took this computer apart, even if you took all the parts, all the parts and you left them outside, you could wait a million years, you could wait a billion years, you could wait a trillion years upon trillions of years and quadrillion, whatever it is, uh, you could wait as many years as you'd like. And I can guarantee you that those pieces will not come together and automatically fit themselves together over time and say, hey, now as a Mac, Mac, MacBook Pro, it will turn on and have the operating system loaded and everything. There's no way. Yet, atheists want us to believe that with all the intricacies to life, you can't take my heart and put it back in and me live again. You can't do that. Atheists want us to believe that this world just happened, that it just came together millions of years and billions of years. And you know why they say millions and billions? Because they don't know. Because they weren't here. But the design definitely shows something. It shows that if there was a design, there was a designer. You know that if you see this, there was a designer. There was someone who carefully thought about where we're going to put the fan, where we're going to put the chips, where we're going to put the batteries, how we're going to mount the, the monitor. Everyone, they, they must have thought about that. And if there's a design, it just follows logically. It follows from our own intuition intuition that there is a designer but don't take my word for it I've got one more video for you here that discusses more precisely the fine-tuning of the universe from galaxies and stars down to atoms and subatomic particles the very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life-permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body, or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. 
If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant, a change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would again be life prohibiting. Or another example of fine tuning. If the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to an incomprehensible precision of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. The fact is, our universe permits physical, interactive life only because these and many other numbers have been independently and exquisitely balanced on a razor's edge. Wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine-tuning. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. If anyone claims not to be surprised by the special features that the universe has, he's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. What is the best explanation for this astounding phenomenon? There are three live options. The fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Which of these options is the most plausible? According to this alternative, the universe must be life permitting. The precise values of these constants and quantities could not be otherwise. But is this plausible? Is a life prohibiting universe impossible? Far from it. It's not only possible, it's far more likely than a life permitting universe. The constants and quantities are not determined by the laws of nature. There's no reason or evidence suggests that fine tuning is necessary. How about chance? Did we just get really, 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 really lucky? No. The probabilities involved are so ridiculously remote as to put the fine-tuning well beyond the reach of chance. So, in an effort to keep this option alive, some have gone beyond empirical science and opted for a more speculative approach, known as the multiverse. They imagine a universe generator that cranks out such a vast number of universes that, odds are, life-permitting universes will eventually pop out. However, there's no scientific evidence for the existence of this multiverse. It cannot be detected, observed, measured, or proved. And the universe generator itself would require an enormous amount of fine-tuning. Furthermore, small patches of order are far more probable than big ones. So the most probable observable universe would be a small one inhabited by a single, simple observer. But what we actually observe is the very thing that we should least expect, a vast, spectacularly complex, highly ordered universe inhabited by billions of other observers. So even if the multiverse existed, which is a moot point, it wouldn't do anything to explain the fine-tuning. Given the implausibility of physical necessity or chance, the best explanation for why the universe is fine-tuned for life may very well be it was designed that way. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect monkeyed with physics and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. There is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. And to that, I say, 
what Romans 1.20 says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. There is a design to our universe. The last classical argument that I want to share with you, it's a simple one, but I think it's a very strong and very valid one, and it's the moral argument. The moral argument is that in every single one of us, there is a moral code. There is something that lets us know whether something is right or wrong, and we all appeal to this. We all appeal to some sense of what is right, what is wrong. C.S. Lewis, I love the way he puts it. He basically says that if you appeal to a moral right or a moral wrong, you're basically comparing your right to a God, to God as being the most greatest being. And you are comparing yourself then to God. The moral code reminds us that, wait a second, if there's morality in us, if there's a sense for morality in us, then where does that come from? If we are just biology, if we're just molecules in motion, then then where, where does that morality come from? Why aren't we like the animal kingdom, for example, that doesn't really care so much about morality? Why is that a concern to us? There is a moral code in us. And it makes sense biblically because even the word of God, what does it say? Uh, The word of God says that we've been created in the likeness, likeness and image of God. So there's a moral code in us. And that is the last classical argument. But I want you to know that atheists really struggle with some of these arguments they often find themselves wrapped in circles because they're trying to get away from an intelligent being often to fall right back into it. I want to show you my very last video today. And this is a video of who I spoke to you about before, Richard Dawkins. He's being interviewed. And watch what he has to say about intelligent design when he is pressed on it. So let's play that video. Well, then who did create the heavens and the earth? Why do you use the word who? You see, you, you, you immediately beg the question by using the word who. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right. How did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, no. no, no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e- evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th- that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, And that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. The atheist himself has to admit that there could have been an intelligent designer. Now, if you caught what he said, It was some foreign being from some other universe. He's basically talking about aliens. He believes that maybe aliens uh, put us here and planted us here. That maybe there was that design. 
And I will tell you why I believe that that is easier for Richard Dawkins to say than for him to say that God is that intelligent designer. I'll tell you why. Because, he's, because he doesn't have to be morally accountable to some Martian, to some alien. But if there is a God that designed him with a purpose, then he must admit that he must be accountable to a God. You and I, I believe, were created for God, according to Scripture. You and I were created for His purpose, to bring Him glory. Even the atheist, at some point, has to admit there could be a God. Here, here's what I'd like to leave you with as my last argument. It's not a classical argument, but to me, it's the, it's the argument. When we talked about the Bible last time, I told you I could give you a bunch of evidence as to why I believe the Bible is true. But the real reason I believe the Bible is true and the real reason why I believe that God exists is because of changed lives. Because of my changed life, because of others' changed lives, because I've seen people change their lives who did not believe in God at one point and now do believe in God. And I see what God has done in their lives. And if nothing else, I will tell you what scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Do you have every answer to every possible question? No, but can you taste and see that God is good? Absolutely. Let me tell you, I've tasted his goodness. I know his goodness. I know his faithfulness because I've tasted it. And this is really what it comes down to. Who is God? Well, when we think about how God exists, we know that he exists because we can conceive that he exists. That's evidence number one. How do we know that God exists? Because the cosmos, the world, everything around us points us to a creator that created it all. How do we know that God exists? Because of its design, the design of the world that shows us that there must have been a designer. How do I know that God exists? this because of the moral code inside of me that lets me know there is a God that cares about right and wrong. Atheists, do you know what atheists really believe about morality? They believe that morality is not objective, meaning there is not a sense of morality that applies to everyone under all circumstances. They believe that morality is subjective, which basically means that morality is based on how you feel about it, how I feel about it, how they feel about it. And the reality is, is that a subjective morality is not a morality at all. Because let me tell you, Hitler had a different morality than we had, than we have. And, and no one is to say that Hitler was right or we were wrong if atheism is true. There's no way of saying that he was right or wrong. It was just his morality. It's just the way he viewed the world. We shouldn't even judge him for what he did. Who is God? More than all of those other arguments, I will tell you, I have tasted God. I know who God is. And there are people that you know, even you yourself selves know that you have tasted the goodness of God and you know the God that we're talking about today. I wanted to provide you with those because when someone tells you there is no God, I want you to ask them certain questions. I want you to ask them a certain question and, and just a few, don't even go to the ontological argument, leave that one alone. But ask them, who created this world? How did it get here? And they say, oh, it's, the universe has always been here. No, no, it hasn't always been here. The universe is expanding. Edwin Hubble told us that, you know, there must have been a, a point where it all started from. But, but who caused that point? We see the effect, what caused it? And you say, yeah, but, uh, okay, there, there is still no God, really? Then why is there design to this world that we live in? 
Why, why are things constant? Why, why is it that we can trust in the morning that we will see the sunrise? Why is it that in the evening, just, just like clockwork, it just works? Like at night, we see the sunset. There are seasons. There are rhythms to life. There are things that happen. Why, why are there patterns in this world? And why is there moral code written in our hearts? Those are the questions I'd like you to ask them. Now, I want you to get equipped as well. I want to share with you, there, there are many more books that I could share with you, but at least these three, I think, are really important books. Uh, Frank Turek, a book called Stealing from God. This book just talks about the fact that atheists, in order for them to be critical of God, they need to take on a Christian or, or theistic worldview in order to be able to criticize the God that they say does not exist. Cold, cold Case Christianity, he, uh, J. Warner Wallace, he is a homicide detective, and he looks through the Gospels as if it was a homicide case that he has to investigate. The last one is a great book. It's how to talk to people about Christ in ways that are not offensive but that are tactical, the book Tactics. And you say, well, I'm not much of a reader. Um, listen, I, I get that. But the reality is that these will bless your life. If you're not much of a reader, I still want to give you two more things. Every one of us knows YouTube. I'd like you to subscribe to at least these two channels. There are m more that I can recommend, but at least these two. Cross-examined uh, by Frank Turek and Living Waters. Um, is another one that's great. It's, it's, it shows you how people can witness to others. Ray Comfort does a great job going to people, doing street evangelism, and you'll be able to pick up some great techniques on how you can talk to people. I want to leave you with a couple of Bible verses here that I think will bless you today. First one, Hebrews 11.6, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those that seek him. And finally, Psalm 14.1 the psalmist says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. Why do people not want there to be a God? Because they don't want to be morally accountable to God. That's, at the end of the day, the reality. They don't want to be held accountable. But if they only knew, if they only knew that every sin that they've ever committed could be covered by the blood of Jesus if they only knew that Christ already died for their sins. I want to encourage you, check these atheists out. Go ahead, check them out. Check out the theists. Obviously, check them out. But one of the things you'll notice about the atheists that you'll see constantly come back all the time is that they create a caricature of what it's like to be a Christian, of what it's like to be a person of faith, and then they criticize that caricature. A lot of times, they have the caricature completely wrong. And I want you to know that God loves you. Yes, God is judge. And many of these atheists, they hate God for that. Literally, hate God for being a judge. They don't want a judge. But what they don't know is that he's also merciful. If they only knew his mercy and they only knew his grace, that's what we know and that's what we're grateful for. Today, I want to pray with you. And maybe you're either watching or maybe you're here and you don't even know what you believe about God. I want you to know that there is definitely a God. I hope the arguments that I shared with you today have been absolutely convincing. But beyond that, I want you to know that there's a God that loves you, that took upon himself really the sin that we committed, and he died in our place. God is a judge. Absolutely, he is a judge. But he is also merciful, and he's also gracious, so gracious that he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for you and for me so that we wouldn't have to pay the penalty of our own sin. Today, I want to pray with you and for you. Let's pray.